when I was approached about reading Circe by Madeline Miller, first and foremost, I was excited because I'd already read it and I really loved it. And so to have the opportunity to get to discuss it uh, was exciting in and of itself. Uh, I have historically actually covered the witch in a variety of different of the courses that I have taught. And then also with my student group on campus, um, former student group, Feminist on Campus United, uh, we hosted a viewing of Practical Magic a couple of years ago and uh, had some very interesting discussions that had revolved around those issues of the witch as well. So to be approached by uh, Jenny and asked to do this, I felt like was a, 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 a boon. I was very excited. Uh, as she mentioned, my prized possession, uh, it's not a great movie, uh, my prized possession as a child was uh, this gigantic tome. This book was as big as and probably weighed as much as I did when I uh, was given it. I was uh, one of the students in our elementary school who had volunteered to help clean out the library, uh, and there were some books that were going to be um, taken out of service, and our reward for our hard work was to get to pick a book out of the stacks that were going to be uh, retired. And I ended up choosing a totally different book, a V.C. Andrews book, by the way, for my sister for her birthday. And, uh, but I'd been eyeing that Greek mythology tome uh, all the entire time. And on my walk home, the young boy who had helped clean out uh, the library offered me the book uh, he picked it out for me. I wish I knew his name, but to this day, I, I have forgotten it, but I would totally give him a shout out because that has greatly influenced every aspect of my life since. Uh, I became utterly fascinated by these great epic tales uh, that a culture of individuals had used to make meaning out of the world around them, the things that frightened them and that they didn't understand that they had attributed to these deities and their whims, and I just found it absolutely fascinating. Uh, years later, uh, as I was pursuing my first master's degree in English literature and I was studying medieval lit, uh, as Jenny mentioned, I was eating lunch in the women's studies department uh, when they needed someone to cover the Medea and the Antigone, and I volunteered because who doesn't want to discuss uh, those great works? Uh, and so uh, both of those were happy accidents, much like this one. And so throughout my academic matriculation and through the courses that I've taught, and I have been, I found myself continuously returning to these giant epic collective tales of meaning making and focus primarily around, around women's roles, both historically and thematically as seen in pop culture and literature. And while, again, my original degree was in literature, I found myself a little bit bothered by the fact that there are these real world issues that were being discussed in literature that allowed us to discuss these uh, concepts, uh, but there was this um, disconnect between what I saw as the academic ivory white tower as a first generation college student. I was scrambling to catch up with some of those norms that I didn't quite understand. And uh, I ended up going for another master's degree where I got to study anthropology, culture, sociology, and women's studies. And that has become my foundation uh, through all of the courses that I create and the studies that I engage in. Uh, so uh, one of the first things that I wanted to discuss before we actually tackle Circe uh, is the sociological aspects of popular culture, because I think it is very important uh, for us to understand why we engage with media the way we do and what the institution of media actually does for us. So there's a fantastic book. Uh, it's a very easy read uh, by David Grazian, if anyone is looking for some suggestions. Uh, it's called Mix It Up, and it's a primer uh, on sociological concepts, and it looks specifically at the institution of media. and how it frames our discourse and our dialogue. And I used a lot of these theories and concepts that he has simplified in this primer in my own thesis years before I found this book, I wish I'd found it earlier, uh, to unpack the idea that there are these big conversations happening 
inside our pop culture that are more comfortable for us to discuss than if we were to just say discuss the neighbor or discuss a relative. Uh, and so since we're going to be talking about women tonight, in particular, we talk about the witch and Cersei and Sabrina. Uh, when we look at these kinds of what's considered um, areas where we are misbehaving or operating outside the typical norms of acceptable behavior, it's gossipy if you're talking about the neighbor next door. But if you're talking about characters in your television shows or in your books, then you get to still have those discussions beside your moral compact, you know, compass, uh, really explore your worldview with those symbols. And they allow us to engage in very, very deeply political, confrontational, huge ideological debates without necessarily having to have that personal stake, which is fascinating. Of course, Grazian has a whole lot of, of, of sociological vocabulary and jargon. I'm oversimplifying these concepts to a large degree, okay? Uh, but I, when you think about those huge ideological uh, issues that we see in media, uh, think about like the first interracial kiss that we saw on television. Does anybody remember what show that was? Uh, anyways, but that was a, a pretty fascinating moment. Uh, I love Lucy, that's a great answer, but it was actually Star Trek. Uh, yes, there, someone got it. Uh, and. Uh, when that first happened, I mean, in the first interracial kiss, it was seen on, you know, mainstream media, it became the discourse, it became a way to talk about those issues. Now, I would like to think that we don't blink twice at seeing those things in our media, uh, such as an interracial kiss. Uh, perhaps a, a simpler example would be the cigarette. Uh, if you look at, anytime you're watching like an old show and you see someone like smoking in the library, or you know the hospital that was always kind of you know telling, uh, but we see these these symbols, uh, and so now because the cigarette has become the symbol of misbehavior, it's something that you do if you're deviant. I'm not saying this personally. This is not an attack on anyone who's a smoker by any means. I'm saying as a society we have shifted our worldview on cigarette smoking. Look at which characters get to smoke in your current television shows. Who, who are the ones that walk around with a cigarette in their mouth? It's almost always um, the villain, or it's the, the super anti-hero who's kind of a dark character. But so when we see something so simple as a cigarette, how that takes on a deeper meaning throughout our pop culture. Um, uh, so these, again, oversimplifying some big concepts. But so we have what's called the macro sociological, the big, huge pictures of what the institutions that influence us and socialize us. We have the conflict theory, the haves and the have nots. And then we have the micro, and that's the area that I tend to find myself focusing on is in those micro, those symbols, the semiotics, how people are interpreting that character, how people are interpreting that specific storyline. What are the discussions revolving around that? Uh, so, uh, the other issue that crops up uh, when I discuss these issues that I want to make sure that we're all on the same page on uh, is when we talk about high culture and low culture, there is a tendency to do so in a way that, that elevates one over the other. The issue is that it's all popular culture and it's all collective activity. So whether it's a Wagnerian you know, opera or whether it's um, monster truck rallies, they're still shared collective activity experiences. And as sociologists, we recognize that we make meaning from those. Uh, and so that's kind of a little bit of background there that moves us into uh, the meaning making that we're gonna be looking at when we analyze these texts. The other key concept that I, Feel that I must address is the concept of patriarchy. Uh, and so before we start to unpack the symbol of the witch, as she's seen in these different media texts, it's important to recognize that what the witch is operating against or operating within is the constraints of patriarchy. And what exactly do I mean when I say patriarchy? So another fantastic reading that I would suggest is Alan Johnson's uh, 
quick treatise. It's, it's a short uh, synopsis on patriarchy. And one of the things that he discusses in his work is that we need to recognize that when we talk about patriarchy that we're not just saying men are evil. I always have to make sure I address that with my students. I, I teach men and masculinities and I have to spend the first week of every semester making sure students know that I'm not there to say men are the source of all trouble, uh, but a system of patriarchy that elevates one sex above another and has systems and institutions in place to uh, keep that process. That's what we're discussing. And so uh, I feel like this might be a little redundant, but I think it's really important to recognize that theorists and feminists in particular uh, use the word patriarchy when we're talking about that system founded on concepts of masculinity that elevate uh, those who are male presenting within these institutions. I feel like I touched on that. Okay. Finally, masculinity in of itself. When we talk about masculinity, uh, when we talk about masculinity, it is important to recognize the gendered world that I'm, I'm addressing. Uh, masculinity is not only within the wheelhouse of men and only men engage in masculine acts. In fact, my original uh, thesis uh, was uh, over the idea that we tend to elevate masculinity even for women. And I find it fascinating how many of my girlfriends uh, have incorporated masculine ideals into their own lives without perhaps realizing it. And so one of the ways that we, I see this most often is, are you allowed to cry? Are you allowed to show emotion? What emotions are acceptable? Uh, and, and so we start thinking about masculinity and femininity. We talk about masculinity in particular. Uh, we talk about being stoic, being the big will, the big provider, uh, not letting things bother us, uh, not forming connections. And I, I have this fascinating exercise that I was worried about the PowerPoint with the connection. Sometimes it takes up bandwidth, so I didn't include it. Uh, but I have uh, the screenshot that looks at the way in which boys and girls toys are advertised through the decade and the main words that are used in advertisements. And what I found fascinating is of course in the boys world, we have kick and we have power and we have enemies and troops and you know, all that lovely language. And in the girls' world, we have glitter and we have magic and we have mother and baby and friend, and of course, a lot of fashion and a lot of beauty. Uh, but what really started to come out when I was studying this is how limited the relationships are in the boys' worlds. Really, the only word that was on there that was a relationship was enemy. Oh, and foe, I left out foe, which is enemy, a contender, someone to compete with. Whereas in the girls' world, in the girls' toys, uh, it was much more collaborative and it was much more about their roles that they inhabit, which is both a boon and a negative, which is what the system of patriarchy, I think sometimes we lose track of. It's harmful to both men and women. We have men who and masculine presenting individuals who are encouraged to um, cut themselves off from emotions in each other's. But we have women who, and female and feminine presenting individuals who are encouraged to only think about themselves in relation to what they are and what roles they inhabit, which is how Cersei starts, by the way. Uh, but I'm jumping ahead a little bit there. Okay, so from all of that background, there is another fascinating book that it sounds like someone will be providing a list of. And if uh, I, I can help facilitate that, I will. Uh, but I wanted to make sure that I touched on because I think it helps lay the foundation for the definition of which that we're going to be working with here. Uh, and this is a, it's a fairly dated book. I'm not going to lie. It's dated now. Uh, but it is, um, it is Emily White's Teenage Tribes and the Myth of the Slut. And I want to apologize in advance if anyone is offended by the word slut. I will be using it quite a bit going forward. Okay. All right. So uh, in this book, uh, Emily White uh, created a sociological study because she started to notice this strange phenomenon. And that was that it didn't matter what circle, social circle she was in, whether she was with work friends or she was with church friends or she was fill in the blank, that everyone she talked to 
could remember the high school slut. And I'd like you to kind of think about that for a minute. How many of you can remember back in your high school days, there was a, there's always at least one girl who was considered the slut. And, and so for it to be that kind of universal experience for that kind of collective consciousness uh, to be occurring, there's something else happening there. And so she wanted to analyze it. It also helps that high school is a microcosm. Uh, uh, it just distorts everything we know about the social world. How many of you remember high school being purgatory? Uh, but uh, it's, it's a fairly fascinating place. But she writes, as adolescents' bodies flood with hormones, rumors become something for them to hold on to. The wordless crashing power of sex makes teenagers want to name it, control it, find a pattern for it. And this is the part I'm going to be using for some of my lecture. The slut becomes a way for the adolescent mind to draw a map. She's the place on the map marked by a danger sign where legions of boys have been lost at sea. She's the place where a girl should never wander for fear of becoming an outcast. And I want you to be thinking about that as I get into the witch because she's also a symbol on our roadmap in our society. She is the place, she's the symbol of where women who will not behave, who will not follow the constraints and rules that society demands, find themselves historically. Uh, so uh, one other thing from uh, Emily White's work, she talks about the slut archetype and she uses archetype in a, what is considered a union, a young, a young way. So Carl Jung, uh, one of a uh, fairly prominent theorists who is also misogynistic. Uh, but so she references, uh, let's see where it is. The slut archetype overpowered the self like a dream or a migraine. The girl and the rumors, the girl people saw when they looked at the slut was part of an unconscious order that existed beyond my interview subjects and beyond their own histories. Becoming the slut, these girls saw reality edged out by a myth that reached back into the past and belonged not only to high school, but to what Jung would call humankind. As Jung defined the term, an archetype is a category of the unconscious. We fall into these categories and their associated images involuntarily. We just start telling stories or dreaming dreams with no idea where they're coming from or why we need them so desperately. Jung used the idea of the archetype to explain the way humankind returns and returns to the same mythic structures. And since we're gonna be talking about myth today, I really thought oh, I should bring this in for our discussion. Now, I would like to point out that, again, very sexist, very misogynistic and written in the 1930s and 1940s. So there's a lot of work to be done around uh, the archetypes of the collective unconscious, but these idea that there's these universal images that have existed and that still exist uh, will influence some of our, our discussion today. So this is, this is the part that I don't like about Zoom. I would love to be actually interacting with the audience right here and it's kind of hard to, to, to do. So I'm gonna barrel on through. I hope you have great questions at the end though. So this brings us uh, to the witch itself. And I wanted to make sure that we have a good working definition of the witch. Uh, so where did the term come from? Well, if we look at the etymology, uh, our words history, there's the old English Wicca, which means sorcerer, depending on your definition. This gets kind of in some linguistic areas that I don't want to necessarily engage in. I'm not going to spend any time on witchcraft, okay? Uh, but uh, when we look at that, we look beyond the Indo-European and the Germanic origins. Uh, there are many theories. Uh, these are the words that mean weak, or to bend or to fold, or wide, which is to see or to know. And I think that those words are really evident of what's happening with the symbol of the witch and the woman. She's, what is she bending and what is she folding and what is she seeing and what is she knowing? And how is that different from what the role of woman should be in a patriarchal society dictated uh, to her? So uh, there's a lot of history on the concept of the witch. We can see her in a multitude of cultures and traditions uh, from Hecate uh, to Yoruba to the Brujeria. Uh, centuries show her as this wise woman figure uh, some echoes that we see throughout some pop culture references. Uh, there's almost always this callback to the maiden, uh, the crone, and I just totally blinked. 
um, mother, the maiden, the mother, and the crone. So this idea of the ages of woman, if you will, uh, we find that across cultures, which is anthropologically fascinating. Uh, but she's almost always a woman with power. And it was only in the rise of the patriarchal male-centric Christianity in Europe in the Middle Ages that these powerful women became increasingly demonized. And it was in the 1400s that the word itself became pejorative and that these women became symbols of this moral oppression, or corruption. Now, many of us, of course, are familiar with the, the witch hunts that occurred in the 1500s and 1600s. I think that we do a fairly decent job in covering that historically now. Uh, but the idea that women were associating with the devil or engaging in power dynamics considered outside their domain, such as expertise, crafts, skills, and sexuality, is a theme that we're going to see in Circe and we're going to see in Sabrina. Uh, this coupled with the fear of the woman alone, the woman who is quite willing to stand on her own and not necessarily have to define herself in relation to others. Uh, and so this fear of these powerful women became a way to uh, subjugate uh, women and diminish their power by calling them a witch. So in short, the word itself has been taken from several words and meanings to label those who had abilities that were beyond them and beyond what was considered the norm. The symbol of witch has endured over centuries as a pr uh, presentation of female empowerment, which is fascinating that at the same time we're trying to use it as a pejorative, as a symbol on the, the map where you're not supposed to go to danger, that we also recognize that it is a, the symbol of empowerment, women who would resist. Uh, and so she represents a challenge to the patriarchal narratives and her place in our literature and pop culture operates as that symbol. Uh, how many of you have seen the growing increase in merchandising? Because that's a huge part of the co-option of feminism is how much of this can you buy the right product? But uh, yeah. Uh, but how many of you see, have seen the we are the granddaughters of the witches you weren't able to burn? Have you seen that taking off, especially in political spheres, uh, ironically around um, powerful women in politics? Right, right. Fascinating, isn't it? Uh, and so, okay, where am I on time? Oh, I'm doing good. Okay. I love seeing all the responses. Thank you. It makes me feel less like I'm talking to my own camera self here. Uh, so uh, I wanted to give a list of some examples of powerful women. And then I wanted to really hone in on what it was about their power that was so frightening. And so the symbol of women as great evil, as the vessels and the harbingers of destruction, right? Yeah, I want that shirt too. Uh, it's a very common trope in literature, and we can look to such prominent figures as, well, what about like Pandora? Pandora famously opened the box, right? It was her curiosity that unleashed all these sins and evils and horrors upon the world. Well, then we can look to Eve. And what did Eve famously do? You know, she ate of the, the fruit of the tree of knowledge. Uh, then we have Lilith, uh, considered to be the first demoness. Uh, now she does appear in Sabrina and she has a very interesting arc in, the, in that uh, series. So I'll be coming back to that current interpretation of Lilith. Uh, one of my all time favorites uh, is Grendel's mother. Uh, so uh, the very ancient text Beowulf uh, was one of the very first medieval literature texts that I really engaged with uh, underneath the tutelage of Dr. Uh, William Wood. And uh, one of the uh, papers that I ended up working on, I was fascinated that while the book Beowulf was all about Grendel, this monster that would come into the lodge and eat men, the real monster was Grendel's mother, this, this creature who could birth monsters. And that when Beowulf defeated Grendel, that's not where the story ends. He had to actually journey deep into her grotto to defeat Grendel's mother. And uh, there's a whole interpretation of Grotto that I think is worth, worth exploring, but another time. All right, so uh, if we move into like Cretian de Troyes and uh, Mallory and the Arthurian legends, of course we have Morgan and Morgana Le Fay. We, you know, once again, we have this powerful witchy woman 
who's over here doing witchy woman things, right? And then of course, because this is what we'll be focusing on today, the Greek women and the Greek tales will discuss a little bit the sirens, uh, Scylla, Medea, uh, and, of, and of course, star of our show tonight, Circe. Okay, so 30 minutes of background and then I actually get into what I'm here to talk about. Uh, I want to give a little bit of a disclaimer. Uh, one of the scenes that I will be uh, doing a little bit of a deep read on does involve sexual assault, abuse, uh, rape to uh, uh, interpretive rape of Cersei. And if that is problematic or difficult for you, please feel free to mute me, step away, uh, come back, see you when I'm past that point. Uh, I usually include that kind of disclaimer early on in the literature about the event that I'm hosting so that you can make those decisions in advance. I was not going to actually cover that scene and then I just decided it was just too important to leave out. So just to give a little bit of a background there. All right, so Cersei's tale. I want to begin with, this is not the first time that we have seen an author come in and give voice uh, to a woman whose agency was lost to history. This is becoming increasingly a very uh, feminist writer's uh, um, conceit, if you will. I love it. Uh, in fact, one of the books listed earlier on the screen is one that I was going to reference. Margaret Atwood uh, wrote the uh, Penelopead, or Penelopead, depending on who you ask, uh, uh, as a, a take on what Penelope, Odysseus's wife's experiences were, which I think is awesome, considering that is included in Madeline Miller's text, right? Okay, so one key thing when we talk about Circe, it is the great book, uh, is to remember what I was saying about the patriarchy and the patriarchal system actually influences even our language and our linguistic choices. The easiest way to get this across is how many of you were a tomboy? How many of you know what a tomboy is, right? A tomboy, of course, is a young girl who has engaged in what is considered masculine or boyish behavior. And it is socially acceptable to a degree, right? And we don't have time to get into what those degrees are, but I think we all have a general understanding of what I'm talking about. So if we have a tomboy, why don't we have a Jane girl? what would even be a Jane girl? Well, that would be a young boy who engages in feminine or traditionally girlish behavior. We don't even have the language for that that's not pejorative or insulting. And that's a whole area that we don't, I won't get into. Another way, another quick way of looking at this is if I say, stop mothering me, all you do is mothering, mother me. We, we, we know what I'm talking about. We have the language built into our culture to recognize that mothering, overmothering, would be all of those feminine traits to the extreme. You're over nurturing, you're overprotective, you're in my business. I'm the mother of five. Okay, so let me tell you, I've overmothered. Okay, so I get it. So why don't we have language like that? or stop, it's hard to even say, stop fathering me, stop fathering me, right? Because we're not even really sure as a culture what we would necessarily mean by that. We start to unpack it, we can see that we might mean stop providing for me or stop judging me maybe, stop, I don't know, okay? What's the role of father in this culture? We clearly know what mother is. We have language for it right there. We have this disconnect for father. So again, I am shortening things. Okay, controlling is an excellent one. I am shortening this a lot to say that uh, even our language is androcentric, which is male support, superior in a patriarchal society. So something really fascinating happened in the last uh, three years. Uh, Emily, and I'm so sorry, I have, I have so many Emilys uh, in this. Okay, Emily Wilson. Yes. Okay, uh, Emily Wilson is the first female to translate the Odyssey. Now, 
She's, she is a medievalist. She has all of the background and the expertise to do so. And in the process of her uh, translation, she started to notice that there were parts that her colleagues in the past who have translated had used their own worldview, which is very patriarchal and sometimes misogynistic, to actually change the interpretation of a word. Now this, I, many people are more familiar with this and perhaps like biblical translation arguments. Well, does this version say this or does this version say this? Well, who translated it? And you get deep into like uh, literature um, and you, you really start really work, people say, well, are you working with this text? Or are you working with that text? You know, and it matters who translated it. And so that's a whole area. But to have a female who came in and translated it and some of the key areas that she was starting to pull out and notice what had changed meaning. So there's one in particular, uh, she looks at the scene where Telemachus, uh, son of Odysseus, is uh, ordered by his father to murder the women who slept with the suitors of his mother. So Penelope's suitors were all put to death, but he also went so far, and it was, and it's, it's coaxed in Madeline Miller's uh, take as a sign of Odysseus's growing paranoia and, and et cetera. But in the original text, the translations in the past have referred to them as whores and as, um, oh, there's another very common interpretation uh, that I'm blanking on right now. When she actually uncovered the word, she found the word was actually slave girl. So how does that change the entire interpretation of that scene that Telemachus has ordered not to, to murder particularly these whores, but these slave girls? And how does that change the meaning, if even a little, or, and, and does that even matter? I would of course argue that it does. And so that's just one example. There were several examples, but she started to really notice uh, that there was a bias. So she was interviewed by the New Yorker and uh, she, there's a quote from her that I think is phenomenal that I wanted to pull in here. Uh, she said, the Odyssey traces deep male fears about female power. And it shows the terrible damage done to women and perhaps also to men by the androcentric social structures that keep us silent and constrained. And so I was letting that ruminate as I was doing my reading, my second read throughs to be prepared for the discussion tonight. And I found myself more and more curious about Madeline Miller's assertions about who and what Circe is. And in the opening paragraph of the text, we have her being situated within the domains and constraints of womanly roles. She's a nymph. She's the daughter of nymphs. She's the, their mothers, their aunts, their lesser goddesses. And she says, tied to a modest power that does not ensure our eternities. So of course, all the masculine presenting and male gods and lesser gods, they're gonna go on for eternity. People are going to remember them, but they're not going to remember us. And she also makes a point to make sure to let us know that nymph also means bride, because where is a traditional woman's source of worth in a patriarchal society? This is underscored throughout many of these opening scenes. Uh, when she speaks of her father in relation to her mother, uh, she writes, um, he believed the world's natural order was to please him. Her mother's actions were perceived through his lens as the center of her universe uh, to such a degree that when he showed interest in Perse, uh, her, her father's response was, she's yours if you want her, right? These are nymphs, these are lesser goddesses, these are deities, but they're still bound within these ideas of patriarchal society. Their worth is in who they can marry and 
what children they can produce. Going past that, there's a very interesting uh, symbol that occurs. Every time Purse gives birth, she is given a sign of wealth or achievement. And it's a string of amber beads. And she's extremely proud of those amber beads because they are a symbol of her worth. In fact, she is absolutely horrified and angered beyond belief when she's told she can no longer have children because they have too much power, which is fascinating, right? But those amber beads are around her neck like a yoke of an ox. So again, women lesser than, women animalistic, women with the symbol of being owned. It's all very patriarchal. Um, women, of course, are there to be consumed. And this goes on in so many descriptions. Um, line 106, line 118, they are, um, they're trade worthy. Uh, the lushness of her figure is as if roasting on a spit. She's literally there as if she's to be um, consumed or eaten. And when Cersei herself is born, her mother is disappointed, right? Because the symbol of, of worth would be a son. She wrinkles her nose and she says, a girl. And I think that that's really, really important to unpack. Uh, another, am I doing on time? Okay. Another key part of this, uh, lines 324 to 335, uh, that ties to this kind of feminist reading. She writes, all of my life had been murk and depths, but I was not part of that dark water. I was a creature within it. So I'm gonna take this back to what I was talking about with sociology and the macro and the micro and take it back to that concept of patriarchy because quite often we find ourselves inside the system, the system of patriarchy. And this is where that key feminist concept of the personalist political comes from, that what's happening to us is bigger than just us. And then that links back to what I was saying about when we study media and we make meaning out of these things, we're allowed to make big connections and be able to have these kinds of discussions about these things through these texts uh, because we are a part of those systems. So I wanted to make sure to pull that line out. All right. Um, so the tale, of course, goes on. Uh, Cersei is a little bit fearful of her own immort immortality. Uh, she's she doesn't quite understand her role. She makes many references to how the other nymphs and um, her mother in particular perform for her father and the other men. Uh, and then of course, what happens in chapter four? Uh, Cersei meets a guy, right? She, she meets a man, she, she decides she's in love and she has to have him for herself. So the first thing that Cersei does here, which is fascinating, is she uses her wiles to gather information. She fixes herself up. She flatters her uncles to gain knowledge. She engages in what's considered those feminine wiles, which is a very witchy thing to do by definition, right? Uh, and then when she doesn't get the answers from those uncles, uh, she turns to her eldest grandmother figure, which is the crone, of course, uh, and asks her to describe her power. And of course, there's language there about the womb and the loom, which is all indicative of these very feminine worlds. Uh, and so in chapter five, the, the magic, the power that she gains, the knowledge that she earns is the knowledge of flowers, which is of course considered a very womanly domain, again. And the moment that she comes into her own and Cersei's story uh, becomes what we're more familiar with from the Odyssey is the moment that she literally challenges patriarchy. She looks her father dead in the eye and she says, you are wrong. And of course the entire courts gasp and they're horrified. You can't tell him he's wrong, that, that's not done. And of course this gets her exiled. Uh, so, there's quite a bit more to unpack with that, uh, but it is interesting that 
the first person that she truly attacks with her magic would be her uh, rival for the boy's affection, the man's affections, uh, Skila. And through transformation, she transforms Skila into uh, this horrific figure that she then goes throughout the entire novel feeling personally accountable for. She created that monster and she is the one that must fix it by the end of the novel, of course, which is interesting. Uh, but so in her exile, uh, her house, um, a monument uh, to her, her new way of living, there's a very interesting analysis that I read about this being the first time she braids her hair. And this comes out of the Emily Wilson's, by the way, interpretation of the text because there's something very uh, telling about a braided woman's hair for this era and what that means. Uh, but the reason that Madeline Miller writes for her to braid her hair is so that it stays out of the trees and the bushes while she's running wild outside of the constraints of patriarchy. She has to braid her hair back so it doesn't get caught. Uh, but magic has given her strength. She's no longer a girl. Uh, and then we're gonna get to the scene that I mentioned earlier. Uh, disclaimer, uh, give me about two minutes to discuss this if you wanna mute or take a moment. Uh, but there is, uh, as usual in many tales, a uh, vast variety of, of mediums, we have this trope that won't go away uh, where the only way a woman can fully come into her own power and become her own entity with her full agency is usually after some horrific trauma that is usually perpetrated by a male uh, offender and it is almost always rape or sexual assault. And so we have this like Phoenix rebirth kind of telling. Now, I say this and I don't wanna dismiss it because it is very much a reality for many women. We have a huge issue with violence in our culture and in our society. So there's a reason that this trope still resonates with so many women and why we keep coming back to it. So I just want to say that. But in this particular moment, uh, Cersei is, uh, has a captain who has stranded himself on her island. She takes him into her home. Uh, the, the scene is very well written in that She's going through what is considered very uh, Greek-centric uh, uh, cultural um, ways of welcoming an individual, the things that you're supposed to do. You have to slake their thirst. You have to feed them. You're supposed to take care of them. These are considered very normative. And he is continuously looking around for signs of a husband, a son, or a father. Because if she's a woman alone, then she is his for the taking. Uh, and she, becomes, she, she has no one to protect her. And so brides, nymphs were called, but that isn't really how the world saw us. As we were an endless feast laid out upon a table, beautiful and renewing, and so very bad at getting away. Boy, that line kept me up. I came back to that a couple times. Uh, again, the onus is on the victim. The nymphs have a bad habit of not getting away kind of hard to get away, right? And in this particular culture. And so more importantly for our discussions today is that in that moment where she's alone and she's vulnerable and she's attacked, she has her voice stolen. He literally steals her voice. And with that, he takes her power. And that's deeply symbolic. If we're doing a semiotic analysis, I would come back to that and I would hammer home on that a lot. But the idea being that without her voice to give power to her magic, she can't stop what's happening to her. And since so often uh, what we see in a patriarchal society and oppressed women is the silencing of her voice, the loss of our agency, that becomes a very deeply meaningful scene. Okay. So in chapter 16, uh, she goes on to find out uh, let's see, she goes on to find out that the actual telling of Odysseus's tale. And there's a, there's a quote that I wanted to make sure I touched on. Humbling women seems to me a cheap pastime of poets as if there can be no story where we don't crawl and weep. And so she sees, you know, what history 
has done to her story. And that is also a very key part of feminist studies when we look at history and who gets to tell history and whose voices we're hearing in a patriarchal society. And that goes back to that concept of women being silent. Um, in chapter 17, in direct juxtaposition of everything I just said, she directly confronts Apollo. She stands before him and she says, I will not be silenced on my own island. And it's a really, really important integral scene. Uh, she's, she's refusing to kneel. She's refusing to follow the roles of patriarchy. Now this goes on further when Penelope arrives at the island and here you have a woman that you were a rival with for a man. I mean, they, they were both Odysseus's lovers and they have their sons there to contend with as well. And Madeline Miller does something really fascinating here where she gives them a collaborative tell. They become sisters in a way and Circe empowers Penelope to stay on her island where she will not be silenced while she gets to take the path that she wants to take and she gets to make the choice in her own agency for herself. It's a really empowering, fascinating passage, uh, which leads me uh, to Sabrina's tale. And I'm down to about 10 minutes if I'm doing my time right here. Yes, okay. So uh, I, when, I, when I actually mentioned Sabrina to, to Jenny, uh, the reason that I brought Sabrina up was because she was just the most current revision of witches that I was seeing all over pop culture and Netflix. We could talk about Charmed. We could talk about, um, there's a new one, Warrior Nun. There's another retelling of the Sword in the Stone happening on Netflix right now. I can't think of its name. Um, there's, there's just this huge amount of witches appearing in pop culture right now. And I think it's interesting that, that we're seeing such a um, glut, if you will, of this kind of program. Uh, so I will say Sabrina was a fascinating uh, watch uh, in that uh, is definitely uh, first. Yes, that was the name of the Arthurian one. Uh, definitely an obvious tell of female empowerment uh, versus the abusive patriarchal system. We, we really, so the original Sabrina was very cutesy and, and nothing against the original, enjoyed it immensely. This new retelling very much engages with this idea of reforming toxic masculinity. And Sabrina finds herself in a coven uh, that is ran by a man Father Blackwood, who is the symbol of patriarchal oppressive authority. And he very much has the system in place where it's a boys club and the boys are the ones that get to have positions of power and the girls uh, do not. And the entire series basically revolves around those very open issues. Uh, I think he just wanted to make sure that I touched there's lots of moments of what I call girlish empowerment. And when I did my thesis on girls empowerment message artists, uh, we have a tendency to take um, feminism and make it kind of glitzy and cutesy uh, as a way to make it more palatable uh, to the mainstream. And so, of course, um, uh, Sabrina says things like, hell needs a makeover. I always thought that was really cute. And the cheerleaders are basically a coven. Now, in season three of Sabrina, Cersei appears as an actual pagan. And she does turn the rampaging jocks into pigs. So we have that kind of call out again. Uh, we also have a very interesting uh, call out to Medea, the entire concept of Medea with Lilith. Uh, I won't give too many spoilers in case you haven't seen it yet, but there's definitely prepare yourself for that. Uh, and so, but the typical debate that is revolving around inside Sabrina that is also revolving around in Circe, which is also revolving around these concepts of the witch and the woman's role in society, is can she have it all? She's cheerleader by day and queen of hell by night. And how is she going to get that dichotomy to work? And how does she manage it all? And uh, I don't know that the show does a great job of answering that, quite frankly. But in Circe's world, Circe is, in the end, um, seeking her own agency. And I think that that's something that 
the witch does, seeks her own agency and her own role uh, within the patriarchal society. So there is just one quote that I wanted to pull from Sabrina. Uh, when she is running for student body president and she and her sister witch Roz, her friend, stand up before the jocks, uh, they announce that they are, Roz and I are running as witches. We are powerful, disruptive women, champions of the oppressed, supporters of the othered, unapologetic feminists, allies to all those who live in the shadow of patriarchy, bringing truth to justice. And when you think about a woman getting to define her own worth as being a witch, a woman who gets to embody those roles, that's what we have with Circe and that's what we get with Sabrina, the witch is still the symbol of resistance to the patriarchal constraints of acceptable womanhood. And I had a whole nother piece on the cult of femininity, but I'm going to call it good there because I can feel my, my throat starting to get a little scratchy. And I would love to open this up for some questions and discussion. If at all possible. And I'll go ahead and help manage with the questions too. Um, I'm going to start off before we with the questions. I'm going to link the survey in here in case somebody wants to leave early. <laughs> um, but anybody that has questions, if you want to put it in the chat box and we can start with those. Uh, the first one we have, um, what other myths, Greek or otherwise, do you think are the most interesting to examine from a feminist perspective? Um, and there's a follow-up question to that. Have you seen the movie The Witch? If so, what did you think? Okay, so all of them. Uh, oh, so that, that one's really tough for me. I think that uh, everything is open to... Um, uh, a feminist perspective and a feminist reading. I have an entire library back here uh, full of, of works. I was absolutely fascinated with Guinevere for a very long time. And so I did a lot of looks at Guinevere and I would argue that she is also a myth. Uh, oh yeah, feminist take on that, yes. Um, so there is a, a Simone uh, de Beauvoir. I always get her name slightly wrong, so I apologize. I think I see Janine Hathaway in the in the audience and she can take me to task for saying that wrong. Um, but she is the author, uh, uh, feminist, famous feminist author of The Second Sex. And she has this quote that I love. It is always difficult to describe a myth. It cannot be grasped or encompassed. It haunts the human consciousness without ever appearing before it in fixed form. And I'd like to unpack that in my class when we look, I teach a course I call Dangerous Women in Film. And we look at the femme fatale and what's called the fighting F boy, uh, which is an action chick that's very sexualized. And we unpack these concepts of what it means to be empowered in a, in a society uh, like this. And I think all of these are myths. All of these are fantastically strong myths worthy of analysis. So you could go to Marvel, or you can go to Homer. Um, there's some very deep breathes. Antigone is a great one. Medea is another phenomenal one. Uh, we can move outside of Greek mythology. There's some really interesting things happening in Norse mythology, Egyptian mythology. Uh, I, I could talk about those um, all night long. My, my cat's name is literally Persephone, so uh, yes. <laughs> um, uh, Medusa is a fascinating one in some of the way that she has been retaped. Uh, there's a, a famous sculpture statue right now uh, that uh, looks at her walking around with the head of Jason, uh, not Jason, um, Theseus. Oh no, which one? I'm blanking right now, I apologize. Uh, whichever one actually beheaded her. Uh, and so this Theseus, Theseus, Perseus, I wasn't prepared for that lecture. It was Perseus, I'm pretty sure. Uh, but, um, but so she, uh, there's a statue that shows her basically not being a victim. Because Medusa's original tale, of course, is that she evoked that attraction. Again, those nymphs who are so bad at getting away. And it was her, her sexual assault that resulted in her being punished. So 
Eleanor Troy is another fascinating one, yes. Okay, I, there was another question there. I'm so sorry. The, the movie, The Witch, I'm trying to remember which one that is, and I don't think I have it at the top of my head right now. It was the one from a few years ago that had Anya Taylor-Joy in it. I think I might have missed that one. I'll have to add it to my uh, my my list. That will definitely be one I'll watch. Uh, okay, so I am a little bit of a scaredy cat. I'm not really good at horror movies. Um, so those are usually the last on my list, full transparency. My students give me a lot of a lot of hard time for that. So are there any other questions? Okay, there's another one. Oh. Okay, the investment Cersei has in her son, uh, Telegonus, is quite fascinating to me in many ways, overwhelmed and controlled by him, and in other ways, finding delight in mothering him and selflessly being willing to do anything to save him. That's not really a question, but. <laughs> but it is, it can very much be a discussion prompt. So let's unpack that just a little bit because I did not touch on that in the lecture enough. Uh, I really do think that having Cersei experience motherhood uh, and Madeline Miller wanting to focus on those moments, those very mortal moments. Cersei does not approach being a mother the way, of course, her mother did, or the other goddesses or demigoddess, or, you know, uh, Telegonus was for her. That was her son, and he was there for her to raise and to do everything for. Her. And there's a lot of self sacrifice around the concept of being a mother and putting your child above all else, which one could very easily argue Cersei did. Uh, in some in particular passages, there's one in particular, and I I apologize, I don't have it in front of me, where it, it, Madeline Miller describes that moment where you're so overwhelmed by the infant that you just don't know how you can go on. And then when they're sleeping, you feel such a bond to them that you can never imagine life without them. And I, I think that that definitely resonated uh, uh, in many ways. Uh, so there is, there is definitely uh, something very interesting there because she chose to have him. She mixed the herbs and she did the ritual so that she could have this child of Odysseus, uh, um, Odysseus after he left. And then she went to war against Athena to protect him from his fate. Uh, so it is, it's very, very fascinating. Oh, if he'd been a daughter, I think it'd have been a totally different story. Uh, that's, that isn't my place to say because this is Madeline Miller's take, but uh, he very much wanted to engage in the masculine concepts of glory and fame and conquer and name, and he needed to go out and do all of those wonderful things that he thought his mother was keeping him from. So, yes, definitely interesting discussion point. Thank you. Any other questions? Comments, thoughts? Okay, here's another one. Um, what struck me about Cersei is that she was very invested in living on her own terms, but that it often meant she was lonely. Is that a common theme that you see um, that embracing that power often leads to being alone? I love this question. I, I absolutely love this question. I think this circles back to those, those feminist discussions about whether a woman can really have it all. Can you be the career woman and the best mom ever and the, the sexy wife and the you know fill in the blanks? Can you inhabit all of those roles? And when a woman does make the decision to say, you know, I don't need or want any of that, uh, that I can be my own I identity, my own person and not define myself in these roles of other people, why do we immediately try to frame that as isolating? And we do this a lot in our pop culture media, and that goes back to that original sociological concept about what are we really saying about what matters in our society? Uh, because I know many women who live primarily all on their own and are very happy <laughs> at doing it all on their own. Uh, so, oh yes, uh, the, the myth of having it all, the, the, it's called the, the double bind, right? The idea that women, uh, have to fulfill it all, the, the invisible second ship. There, there's, there's so much literature and research around these issues that I could lecture on it. First, I do lecture on it for 16 weeks. Uh, so uh, I'll try not to do that here. But I do think that 
I would like to see more media examples of women who are comfortable and happy as their solitary selves. I think that that's not the necessity, the idea that that is the end of a woman says something about our cultural ideas. When you think about how often we see the lone male in these uh, TV series, how often do you get to see the lone female? And so that that's definitely worth unpacking. Um, someone else said uh, that she would love to hear your take on the Persephone myth from a feminist revisionist standpoint. Do you have three hours? <laughs> um, so Persephone is a fascinating line. Uh, very sh I'll give you this a very condensed. I have seen, there's a very popular web series, uh, Webtoon, uh, Webtoon uh, that has taken on the Persephone myth and has reached a young audience. And, and we're seeing this on TikTok and we're seeing uh, this in Witch Circles, Laura, that's the name of it, uh, where Persephone is being given much more agency in her original interpretation of her relationship. Was she kidnapped by Hades? Was she given to Hades? Did she choose to stay with Hades? Um, and it's, I think, again, an excellent example of what's currently happening in our culture and in our society around these concepts that we want to retell these ancient stories with a more feminist perspective and ask, what, where is Persephone's voice in the original tell? You know, um, the goddess of spring spending six months in hell or Hades, the underworld married against her will. I, there's, now when you get into the actual literature translations, that's another area. And again, I don't have time for all that. So it's very, I don't think I've heard of Hades town. I'll have to look at that one. And there's another question. Um, one thing that was interesting to me is that Cersei was on a path to discovering herself, which is a common theme among women today. Uh, is this a modern theme that was added to the Greek myth or a theme that we see in the history of the witch? Okay. So in the original tale, uh, there are three actual Greek texts that Circe appears in. And so it kind of, this question, it really depends on what you're, you're referencing. She is, she's still a background character. She's not um, considered a main character in those tales. So I don't think we get to spend too much time on her agency per se. Um, she's, I think this idea of Percy, or I'm sorry, Cersei on the path of discovering herself is what Madeline Miller really, really wanted to, to pull in and, and, and analyze. Uh, I don't know that you would see that in the original Greek myths. Now in the history of the witch, of course, uh, the, in the history of the witch, the idea of woman's agency is, is a key part of all of that. And um, I do think, so I don't know how familiar all of you are with uh, social media, but I, in TikTok, uh, there's different like areas that basically based on your algorithms and what you're you're supporting and you're liking and you're you start to kind of get a different feed. And there's an area that's now called witch TikTok or witch talk. And I find it fascinating because if I had the time, I would do a sociological study of it. So much of it is around these ideas of feminism and empowerment and not really around witchcraft, which is nothing against witchcraft itself, but uh, it's not really the the uh, it's not really the religion aspects or even the ritualistic aspects. It's it's empowering aspects. Oh, you made it to which TikTok, and I'm here to tell you why women rule. You know these kinds of uh, takes, and so I find it fascinating that that's happening right now in our current era. So I, I hope that answered your question. I, I I always see your questions for a brief moment, and then they go away, and then I forget if I actually answered. Well, she did say that um, she was referring to Madeline's take on the um, Cersei finding herself. Um, and someone else mentioned that Miller said that she wanted to understand why Cersei turned men into pigs. Mm -hmm. I, I did get to watch one interview with Madeline Miller uh, before I did this presentation, but 
And I did look at the Q and A's at the end that she provided. And I think, uh, again, I always hesitate to speak for an author. I can give you the interpretations of what I think they meant, but uh, I, I would say that she very much wanted to explore that area of agency. And I think, I think turning the men into pigs, of course, is a, is a deeply symbolic take. Uh, the, the transformative powers of a witch is also a deeply symbolic take because women have the ability um, uh, to, to create life, to give life, and to transform. Uh, and so there's this, this long-standing historical take of a woman's power and how it's tied to those ideas of transformation that I think is being unpacked in a lot of different areas. Um, and we still have about 20 minutes. So if anybody else has any thoughts or questions, um, we still have time. I feel like I did a really, really quick read on Sabrina. So if anybody wants some more con more from Sabrina, I, I have pages and pages from that one, but um, I, <laughs> so yeah, I ran into the problem that when I agreed to this, Jenny, it was like last year, midsummer, and I was like, oh yeah, I'll totally cover that. And then when it came around now, I was like, oh no, it had a serious finale. I have to make sure I understand uh, the the coverage of, of that. So I binged an entire season in the last- We did have a quick question. Um, what are the three texts that you referenced which uh, feature Cersei that you uh, mentioned maybe earlier? Give me one quick second. I'll put them in the, the text I think, or in the chat. I think that would be easiest, All right? Um, maybe, maybe not. I'll have to remember exactly which ones. We can Let's also provide an annotated um, list of the readings that Jody mentions. I was gonna say, and, and if anyone, wants to get it from from Jenny, that's fine. Or if you want to shoot me an email, uh, granted I'm teaching a pre-session next week, so I might be a little frantic right now, but um, I will I will try to get back to you. Okay, I, I'm sorry, I got a little discombobulated there. I will get you the three texts. And Sabrina, I did want to talk. Okay, so no spoilers, as he asks. Okay, so Ezra, um, so no spoilers. I do really, really want to talk about one scene in particular in Sabrina, but it's in the finale, so I feel a little uh, constrained there. But it's about Lilith, uh, and um, yeah, you know what? I'm not going to do it. I'm just not going to talk about that one. Uh, let uh, we, did, so. we did have a question uh, that someone would like to hear more on the Persephone take? Oh, <laughs> okay. Uh, there's so many coming through now in Egyptian mythology. Um, all right, let me, let me separate these into three distinct questions here. Let's start with the Persephone and I I Isis. Um, so I am less familiar with Egyptian mythology. Uh, maybe if I'd gotten that book as a child, that would have been the one that I took off on, but it was Greek mythology that I followed to the end of days here. Uh, but I was of course interested in mythology in general. So I did look into some of that mythology, but I would not in any way call myself prepared to have that discussion. As to the Persephone question, uh, I do think that based on the popularity of that webtoon and then it not just being the webtoon but the musical and other areas that we're seeing that we're seeing this this um i think margaret atwood actually started it with the penelope ad and i know there are other versions outside of greek mythology but this idea of taking these women who have had these lesser roles and then asking what's their tale and what's their agency. And I think Persephone's in particular because her, her story is one that is all about kidnapping and trafficking and being held against her will and being married against her will. 
uh, I think that all of that becomes something that we want to resist and we want to see a different take on. And so I'm, I'm excited to see that we are doing something more with that take. Um, okay, and then there was another question in there. Uh, someone did ask uh, what your favorite book is about witches or a witch. So um, fun fact, this is one that there's only two, th two uh, that in any medium that I think a series or a TV or movie is better than a book. And that is, I'm, I'm the librarians are glaring at me. I feel it. Uh, but I think the Lord of the Rings trilogy is much better in the film than it is as the books. And I think Practical Magic is a much better movie uh, film than it is a book. I know, I know, horrifying that I would say that. Uh, but <laughs> I think Practical Magic is probably one of my favorites. Discovery of Witches is a really good one. Um, I'm blanking on a few more right now, but there, there's, there's quite a few really excellent ones out there. I will compose a list also and, and share it wherever Jenny asks me to. Um. Uh, we have a few other comments that just came in. Somebody had confirmed that Cersei's in the Odyssey, Hesiod's Theogony. Theogony. I was going to say, I knew it was Ovid's Metamorphosis and I knew it was the Odyssey. I wasn't 100% sure on that third one. So thank you, Jenny. I appreciate that. Yeah, and someone also recommended a few other books. Uh, Bear in the Nightingale series by Catherine Arden. I I've read it know. too. Those are really good, but they're based in Russian mythology. Oh, that sounds fascinating. I will have to check those out. Uh, okay, I see Maria. I do think that Chilling Adventures of Spirit is pretty shallow feminism. So I, uh, my original thesis was on feminism in and of itself and looking at what is considered post-feminism world or which I highly de debate that concept in and of itself. Uh, but I've seen this co-option of femininity, uh, particularly in pop culture, uh, where we see feminism being co-opted as what I call the um, uh, the promotion of toxic masculinity. So basically doing everything that men has done because that's what makes me a feminist. Uh, and so that's really problematic. Uh, the commodification of feminism, which is when it's like you can buy certain products and they're gonna make you more feminist than others. Uh, there's, there's just different areas that I studied and coded for in music lyrics that influence how I perceive feminism and the authentic choice of feminism. Uh, so I will say, I feel like the, uh, the writers of Sabrina started in a very good place, uh, really was trying to challenge some of those patriarchal norms and this concept of toxic masculinity. There, I would, on a personal level outside of lecture, I would say that they kind of lost control of that narrative a little bit and uh, it, it could have been better. How about that? Oh, yes. Okay, so I do use Susan Douglas's argument enlightened sexism in my 287 issues course at the end. Uh, and yes, that was one work that did influence my take on uh, feminism uh, indeed. Okay. Um, I haven't seen Discovery of Witches as the TV series yet. That is on my to watch list, but I had to binge Sabrina for you all. So um, Discovery of Witches is, is one. I actually, so one of my other areas of study have been romance novels and uh, I had to watch Bridgerton uh, because it's what's currently in the most pop cultural discussion box. Uh, and so now I find myself veering back into my studies on romance uh, novels, and I, I don't have time for that. So, but yeah. We, yeah, we did have a few comments. Um, Once uh, we had somebody that said they finished The Witches of Ash and Ruin, which draws on Irish mythology. Okay. So another uh, recommendation. <laughs> And then we had another one that said um, that she wanted to add that Isis was the goddess of magic and stole power from Ra, um, which she adds to her own power. So that would be another interesting myth to look at regarding the witch. Yeah, that I, I'm going to have to look into that one as well. Uh, the Arthurian uh, take, Mist of Avalon, is is really good. Of course, Marion Zimmer Bradley's recent, oh, someone's already mentioned that, uh, has had some problematic um, 
press about some of her behavior. Uh, and this gets into those debates about genetic criticism when you, um, you know, JK Rowling is another uh, very prominent example. Can you separate a work from their authors? I do find it fascinating not to go on a complete feminist rant here, but we tend to have these debates around women authors a lot more than we do male authors. So we do have a really interesting question. Um, can someone write a feminist text if they're not a feminist? It's a fascinating question. It is. It's an absolutely fast. So it would okay, so from a literature perspective, it would argue I would argue that you can depends on what critical approach you're using. If you're doing a genetic criticism or an author intent critical approach, then no, you cannot separate the author from the text. But if you're doing a purely reader response text, you're just saying, I'm, this is only, I'm only focusing on audience analysis and how readers are interpreting this. Okay, I mean, uh, it's problematic. It definitely, I tell you, I've been teaching in this field for over a decade now, it's scary to say that. And when I first started, the average student's understanding of some of these concepts, I spent good four to six weeks of my courses just covering what I would consider to be very basic knowledge. And now these students are coming in and let me tell you, I spent two weeks playing catch up. Like, okay, all right, there's words for that now. Got it, you know? And, and you just, it's, it's, uh, it's been a roller coaster. It's fascinating. Uh, yeah, I'm not surprised that, so I would, okay, I would not identifying as a feminist is a fascinating argument in and of itself. It is a statement that she has made, but it gets into what is a feminist and people, so of course we have the womanist arguments, we have the humanist arguments, we have the arguments about language. Um, there's, there's so much to unpack there. Again, that's another two hour lecture. So I won't, I won't do that one now. And yes, Azra, I would agree, all texts can be useful when looked at through a feminist eye. I would argue, in fact, that there are some very problematic things that are worthy of analysis simply because we can look at what they're saying. Definitely. Um, let's see. And we do have see. another question. Um, what's a good example of, I think, looking at something from a feminist perspective? perspective? Uh, so comic books uh, in general would be my first go-to uh, response to that. Many comic book artists are um, very, very focused on objectification and disembodying female uh, figures. We have what's called the Hawkeye effect, which is a fascinating take on this. Uh, and so that medium in itself can be very rife uh, with sexist and misogynistic content. Uh, but that does not mean that you can't do a very deep feminist reading and not have some feminist interpretations. Uh, so another good example of this uh, would be, um, uh, so right now in that kind of circle, there's a lot of debates about the, the token scene of all the women coming together to band together. And so we have that scene in the uh, Avengers movie where all the female characters, you know, we've got each other's backs. And it's a very empowering moment, but it, it feels very tokenized and very lacking because why are all of these women doing that? Do they even know each other? What's the connection here? They, they didn't know, they didn't do a lot of groundwork for that. Uh, when you juxtapose that with the take in The Boys, which is, problematic and not a feminist <laughs> show, uh, but there's a scene where the three females come together to uh, attack, to, to basically, you know, take on a villain, and it has more uh, punch and it connects more because there's actually a reason and a rationale for them to be doing that. And then if you take that even a step further uh, to The Mandalorian, and no spoilers, but there's a really, really kick butt scene where um, a, a, a large group, uh, a, a an impressive group of female characters come together and it's not, it doesn't feel like pandering or tokenism because it makes sense for the plot. Does that make sense, Kendra? I, I kind of went all over. Oh, so Ashley, actually, yes, it, it felt very pandered to. And it, 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 I feel that Ashley, I do. I, I love the scene and I hate the scene, but that is a joke that my students make quite often about my classes is that um, I ruin media for them and I, I'm not ruining 
media, I hate that. Um, they, they, a student went so far as to have a bumper sticker made of have you been Simonized, which I find both flattering and offensive. Uh, but there is this idea that they're still problematic. My favorite thing in the world is action adventure movies. And let me tell you, you want to talk about an area of genre that is just full of misogynistic crap to unpack, right? And so being, you know, aware that, hey, what I'm watching is problematic doesn't necessarily mean that you can't find enjoyment around it, I guess. We did get a comment um, about the life cult coaching spiritual counselor movement today has a lot of women who identify as modern witches and they use plant medicines. I would, so I, I made a point to say at the beginning, I'm not going to touch on witchcraft because I feel like uh, that is definitely an area outside of what we were doing here. But I will say we have seen a huge uptick in uh, women engaging in what is considered traditionally witchcraft. Uh, and, and both as a religion, both as rituals, both as just uh, being more connected to one another, sisterhood elements, and then also in this uh, homopathic connection uh, to plant medicines and herbalist ways of life. It, it's fascinating to me, you all, excuse me, you also see this in um, the medical field, uh, doulas in particular, midwives, uh, there is a, a fairly large percentage that do identify with some of those concepts of witchcraft. I won't, I don't want to speak out of turn to them because again, that depends on how they're using the word, right? Uh, but um, the, when I, earlier in my speech, when I referenced the witch being a symbol of a woman who has skill sets and crafts and knowledge that is considered uh, too great. And so then by that definition, she's an outcast. One key area that we saw that historically is, of course, in the medical field. If a woman engaged in herbalism and engaged in, uh, you know, the very first uh, group of individuals devoted to birthing were, of course, women and the doulas and midwives. And it wasn't until we turned it into a science and decided that we needed to make money off of it that it became a much more, and, and there's a very frightening history uh, around all of that uh, that made it become more of a medical field and become the onus of men and male dominated in a patriarchal society. And we've had a lot of historical issues with breathing around those issues. So yes, excellent example. Okay, we have about two minutes left. Um, are there any final questions? Um, and I'm going to go ahead and post the link to that survey in the chat one more time um, in case anybody hasn't had a chance to do that. Um, I'll give you another minute or so if you have any last minute questions. Okay. Well, I wanted to end on this note. Um, I think it's very, very important that at the end of Circe, uh, when she's leaving Penepe Penelope and she's uh, getting ready to basically embrace her mortality. Uh, and she, Penelope basically says, can I stay on the island? And she says, and are you going to tell me how goes your witchery? And she smiled her inward smile. You were right. It is mostly will, will and work. And I think that that's really important that the, the magic of witchcraft, the witchery was handed off to a mortal woman and it was simply knowledge and the power and agency to stand by herself. So I thought that that was kind of a telling note to end on. And I think I did that at the end of my wrap up that I can't remember now. Rap Queens is great. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I like Marvel, um, a whole lot of Marvel. Um, Definitely different storylines in there. <sighs> I have not read the new Runaways. Uh, I was disappointed when the series was taken off the air. Uh, I don't know why I didn't put the chat box up here on the screen to begin with. This is a lot easier. <laughs> uh, my mistake. Okay. Well, I really appreciate you all pulling me out of the chaos uh, of, of, of everything around me right now and get to do something fun like this. I really enjoyed it. 
Okay, I want to thank everyone for coming to tonight's program and I definitely want to give a big thanks to Jody. It was a really engaging discussion. And again, thank you everyone for your support for the Wichita Public Library and the Big Read. Um, and this will end tonight's program. Thank you so much.